Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory, Glory to God, and peace to the people of God. Lord, we Jesus you are with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship, and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in the attendants above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds 
shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live pole that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the word of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Let us read Chapter 13 in your leaflet um, responsibly by half verse. Glory to you, Lord God of our fathers. Glory to you for the radiance of your holy name. Glory to you in the splendor of your temple. Glory to you seated between the cherubim. Glory to you beholding the depths. Amen. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now a reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father, it is with that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. <clears throat> now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, the leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do, apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? 
Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you. We speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. And yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not excuse me. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The gospel of the Lord. Praise be the Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In reflecting once again on a sermon on Trinity Sunday, it was a couple of years ago that I actually had the opportunity, after many decades of preaching on Trinity Sunday, to have a good and wise person share with me that if you spend your time doing theology, then you're really not really doing what this is, this feast is about. Because if you think about it, what do we know? What do we know about the Trinity? We know there is one God and that there are three persons. We know a little bit more about that. And that we know that the persons are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Distinct persons, yet unity. One God. We don't know why. Why is it one God, three persons? How does that work? That doesn't make any sense. But it's a fact. Which brings us to understand the fact of mystery. We are okay with the fact that, you know, God is mysterious in some ways and in other ways, but yet in a practical sense, when we live our faith, we kind of let go a lot of times of the idea of mystery because we seek to have things quantified, qualified. We want to have them defined. We want to have them clear, and they have to make sense to us. That's that. They have to make sense to us. Whatever happened to God? It makes sense to God. So as an issue of faith, we look at the Trinity and we understand it best because that's the way Jesus and, and the Father and the Spirit have revealed themselves to us in relationship. That's who God is. We hear Jesus always referring to the fact that he is passing on what he has heard from the Father. And that at the very end, and we heard it last week at Pentecost, we heard about how the Spirit was going to come and he was going to, to take what the Father has given the Son and is going to share with us. And, and there's that unity there that really is um, important. Now you can sit back and say, well, that's, that's good for God. God's united. But what we might forget is let's go all the way back to Genesis. All the way back. And what does it say about you? And what does it say about me? We are made in the image and likeness of God. All of us. 
And so that Trinitary mystery applies to us. We are dis different people, distinct persons, but yet we are one family of God. And what God is, God mirrors in his creation and creating us. We are similar to God, obviously not God, but we are similar to God in that we are his children. And that same relationship applies to us. And if we look to scripture, we never see the Trinity, one going for the other. It's not like Jesus comes here and says, well, the Father says this, but hey, let's do it this way. Or you have the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit a lot of times gets that free willing, you know, you do whatever you want kind of thing. But, you know, the Father and the Son kind of say one thing, but hey, let's just let our hair down and do whatever we want. It's not the Spirit either. The Spirit brings to us what the Father has revealed to the Son and the Son to us. And again, we get back to relationship. They never contradict each other. They act as what they are, the Father, Son, and Spirit, one God. Now, how about us, since we're made in the image and likeness of God? I think the first and the best question then to ask is, What do we want to change about others? We're really, really into this in Christianity for a couple of millennia, aren't we? We want to change other people. We are really, really dead set on. They come to us as who they are, but then we tell them what they should be or what they could be. We can get really good into telling them what they're not, and maybe we've even experienced that ourselves. There's differences in language, culture, and faith, and most certainly way of life. And it's an interesting thing. Where is a good place to look and to get an understanding of how this stuff is supposed to work for us as church? Well, we go back to the beginning after Pentecost when Jesus establishes the church and how did the early Christians live? That was before, you know, we started piling on all kinds of human-made and crazy things that God did not intend. And maybe a good example would be that if we had someone like Nicodemus sitting right here, and he would sit in the front pew, if not up in the altar. And Nicodemus could tell you everything you always wanted to know about God, about 10 other things you didn't would tithe and give 10% of whatever he made to the, to, the, to the church. He would observe all the dietary laws and all the other laws for that matter and probably would dress really nice, impeccable, fine robes, fine garments. And there you have the Nicodemus. Talk about him, but more about him a little bit later. And then who plops down in the seat next to him? Joe or Jane Gentile? Okay? And again, you've got to understand that the early times in this, you didn't have to go far for the culture and the, the ways to change because there wasn't a lot of, you know, cross-pollinization. There was a lot of movement. So you didn't have to go far to find somebody doing something really different. But you got this Joe or Jane Gentile, and they kind of plop down next to them. Hey, how you doing? You know, almost you can figure out it's like a 60s hit. Uh -huh. You can tell what I do. You know, probably some wild hair going on. Maybe it's been a while since they like had a shower. <laughs> some sandals on their feet, you know. And probably not too long ago, was worshiping some stone idol, eating meat that was sacrificed to the gods, uh, and doing all kinds of things which we won't talk about in polite company as part of their daily life, sitting next to the Pharisee. I bet you the Pharisee was saying, oh, whatever that guy's got does not get on me. <laughs> you know? Could you sit down, Wynn? Yeah. And see, it's funny, but it's not. 
Think of the differences between those two people. And then you've got a whole bunch of these Gentiles running around doing all kinds of sorts of things in their past and their history, and all kinds of different traditions, languages, cultures, foods, you, you name it. You can just see the sparks coming out of his ears. And that's what you see in the gospel, because here comes Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a great and perfect example for us today of ourselves. Not that we're Pharisees, we're not. First of all, he comes to Jesus at night, and that's just not put in there for set in the scenery. For John, night is a very important type of reality. He comes at night because he doesn't want anybody else to see that he's going to this, this itinerant preacher, and what does he say? What's the first words out of his mouth practically? No one can do what you do unless they come from God. So he, he says, we know. We know this. But we're not going to listen. And I'm going to come at night. Now Nicodemus does come around. But where's everybody else? They knew he was from God. And they didn't listen. Because it meant that Joe Gentile, or Gentile, yeah, take that, and the Pharisee, they had a work and play ball. Do you remember that from your elementary school report card? They never got that. It does not work and play well with others, you know? But we have to get along, and not just get along and saying, I'm going to tolerate you. Maybe you want to sit a few pews down there. But they got along very well. Because the difference is, is that they were able to put aside those things which were really earthly bound and live a life of faith. Now let's come forward a couple thousand years to today. We as an Episcopal church, and it's not unique to us, but since we're Episcopalians and we're an Episcopal church, if I'm going to use the word, we say that, and we believe that we're open to all without judgment, as it's said in Scripture. So the question again for each of us is who do we welcome and who do we not welcome? Now we don't welcome certain behaviors, we welcome all people. Do we welcome or do we not? And again, think about different worship styles. My favorite example is, and it's, and it's funny, 40 years it still gets a laugh because it's funny and it's not. Let's say next week I come in and say, okay, let's change things up. You all have to sit in a different place. I could do some kind of abomination on the altar. You wouldn't care half as much as the fact that you're going to lose your seat. I can't sit where I want. What are you? Some kind of like devil worshiper? But religious practice and style. We say all are welcome, but do we worship in a way which makes everybody feel welcome? Or that we kind of can change from something to another to make people, you know, we're, we're in it for the other person. How about lifestyle? Oh, how about lifestyle? Imagine if each of us could, and I'm not saying we're going to do this, come up and stand here in front of the altar, and you just start talking about things that you do in your own home, things that are going through your mind, things you have in your heart, and there's going to be a lot of really good stuff there but it's not going to be the same as the person sitting next to you. And maybe, just maybe, we might have a few quirks. Now, even less, I'm sure, would have faults or failings. I'm sure, you know, I know I do. I'm sure you do. But lifestyle, all getting together in the same place. What kind of craziness is that? Those are earthly terms. That's because Nicodemus couldn't understand the being born again, which was meaning that he didn't have to start life all over again, but he had to see it in a very different way. And the grace of God was going to help him there. And it did, because we hear about him later. He was a success story. Because he was open. He comes at first at night because he wasn't quite ready. But he comes along. But he can't get his, like, how do you get born again? Well, we have all kinds of crazy ideas about born again, though. But really what this is saying in Scripture aside from what other person's practices may be, is living the Trinity, living as many people as one family of God. Three persons, 
one God, and they're different, they're distinct persons. Let's not go any further because then we start playing with heresy. That's all we know. That's all we really need to know because it's that relationship that is what we are a part of as God's children. So we need to accommodate and welcome others without judgment, without qualification, and follow Christ's message. And it makes for a whole different world, different church. Now, we don't have to agree with them. We don't have to compromise our values. I'm sure when the, the those Pharisees like Nicodemus changed, I don't, I'm sure they didn't all give up their dietary laws and their religious practice. That was fine. They were close to God. That's the way they did it. But Joe or Jane Gentile, they weren't about to do that stuff. But they did love God and worship God in their own way. And they were great members of the church. A great example and wonderful for us today as we celebrate Memorial Day, Memorial Day weekend, is a good question. That we were talking all this religious, but let's even talk in a secular sense. For those of you who may be in the military, or any of us, of course, we all have familiarity with the military in some way or another. How effective or successful would any military organization be if it was not unified? They put you in boot camp and they get you all work together even though you're a lot of different individuals. Because you need to work together to be successful in defending our country and all those things that they need to do. Can you imagine each one going in our own different direction? We would never have had a revolutionary war. We'd still be drinking tea and eating scones and being British. We wouldn't have to worry about World War II because there would never have won World War I. And again, I'm not advocating any of those things in a religious sense, but what I'm saying to you is this is a secular example of the, the reality of unity. Unity. Let's get back into the church. I'm thankful very much for those men and women who are in our military. But how about us? Is this God's army? No. Yeah. This is God's family. All of us. So today is a great invitation. It's kind of that transition between our Lent, Easter, you know, kind of stuff. All that, those seasons are all wrapping up, and then we kind of get into what they call ordinary time or regular time or time after Pentecost, however you want to phrase it. But what it is, is it's a great invitation for us to recommit ourselves to our family and the unity that needs to be there. So if we're around and we're shooting our mouth off about something, about something we really have an issue with, and someone comes up behind us and... Wow, I guess I'm not welcome here. Or if we're talking conversely about the fact that everybody's welcome. We love that you're here. You are important, but we're all family. So if you want to sit here in your tuxedo and your 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 Pharisee thing, you do it. And if you want to come in with your Hawaiian shirt and your sandals, you do it. We're all part of the same family. That's what the Trinity shows us. If you want to waste your time, uh, I shouldn't say it that way because I spent an awful lot of time in the seminary learning this stuff. You know, you can do all the theology, and it's it's got that. It's relational. Father, Son, Spirit, God, us, family of God. We need to celebrate that. Because if we didn't have the diversity and the beauty of life that we have, where would we be? I don't even want to think of it. Great invitation today. Not just to celebrate the truth, but to live it in our daily lives. May God be blessed. Amen. Invite you at this time, if you wish, to please stand and let us profess our faith. We believe in God. Maker of of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in the one Lord Jesus Christ, and the only Son of God, who is ever been God from God, from God, light from light, true God, true God, we have not made it, but so we believe the Father, who is all that is a man, for his slower salvation, he can have from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He be given and guided for the rich and merry, speak of the end. For our sake, he was crucified with the conscious power, 
By your spirit, we live with you and one another in mercy, joy, and justice. Infuse the church with the spirit to proclaim the resurrection. May it reach your people in the darkest areas of the world. Bless the work of Bishop Kevin and his love for your children and guide the diocese along the path of change and commitment to you. Miraculous God, here. Give zeal to missionaries to preach the gift of the Spirit. Miraculous God, here. Energize world leaders to affirm different points of view amongst themselves. With a renewed spirit, help them to strive for justice and nonviolence. <laughs> Keep your people in the Middle East and Ukraine safe. Miraculous God, hear our prayer. Purify the hearts and leaders of our government. Help them to resolve difficult issues with respect and dignity for each other. Miraculous God, hear Give us a renewed spirit to deal with poverty so that we can provide adequate food, clothing, and shelter. Miraculous God, yeah. equip school boards with wisdom and compassion as they provide an education for our youth, as well as the plight of the taxpayer. Miraculous God, yeah. help us to honor those who gave their lives for the betterment of our nation. Keep the members of our armed forces safe, both abroad and domestically. Miraculous God, yeah. give good health to the infirmed and increase the faith of the dying. Miraculous God, yeah. Lord, keep us in your love. Oh. 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 Let us also, I offer and commend to your prayers, let us also pray for George, Bob, and Joan. Miraculous God. Hear our spirit. Lord, keep us in your love, preserve our community, and do not let us become separated from one another. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most we We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son Jesus Christ. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. He's <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. All things come of thee, O Lord. <laughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. <laughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you, excuse me, for with your co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons, and unity of beings. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Heaven and earth, we hear the light. Most of the heavens, 
Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has brought us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be pleased. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. 
the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Amen. And together as one family of God, mirroring the Trinity, we pray our prayer of St. Alphonsus for those people who join us and celebrate and are part of our parish family remotely or virtually as we are one in the Lord. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in this holy sacrament. I love you in the holy things. And I desire to receive you in the of my soul. So write me not as a moment to receive you sacramentally. How much we are here to my heart. I am willing to see you when I see you when I see you when I see you. I saw my old school with you. Never if from Let us pray our post communion prayer. Eternal God. Send us minds to world peace. Grant us strength and courage to love and serve you. Let us, in the last example, 
us. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Just want to take this opportunity to thank all the people who have worked so well and made the Easter season and Pentecost, particularly Pentecost, uh, such a wonderful celebration to come together. Our little social gathering afterwards was really wonderful and to celebrate graduation. Also, I'd like to remind you that on the 5th of June, which I believe is a Wednesday, we will have our ongoing um, adult information and education series. Please check the bulletin for that. And there is a list to sign up in the hall. Please do so. Also, just to remind you a little bit more distant is the um, parish picnic on the 23rd, which is a Sunday that will be one service on the 23rd. It will be at 10 o'clock. And earlier than that, we'll be eating hot dogs and hamburgers too early in the morning. But the service will be at 10, and then the um, we'll have the refreshments afterwards. The service, the one service at 10 o'clock, will be in the Memorial Garden, like it was last year, weather permitting. Uh, we'll have the benches out there, if you'd like. But a lot of people last year just brought lawn chairs and felt very comfortable to sit on the lawn. So you're welcome to do either. And um, you'll get more information, and we'll talk more about that as the time goes near. Thank you. I'd like to ask for prayers to come up from George and Connie Alford. Uh, I don't know if any of you know them, but they're over to St. Margaret's. They are members of St. Margaret's and have been volunteering with us at daybreak for a whole lot of years and kind of a, a poor, poor twosome and a, a great help and lovely people. Um, George has most recently been diagnosed with an, an uncurable uh, widespread cancer and he has been in the ICU at St. Luke's. So your prayers of comfort and peace Oh, Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. 
The deconstruction phase. Well, take her away. 